us all the picture. At the time of Resolution 181, the Jewish settler population had ownership of only 6% of historical Palestine. At the time of Resolution 181, the uh, Jewish Zionist settlers had title to 6% of the land. Palestinians owned both publicly and privately the 94% of the land. Meaning from, 19, from 1876, where the first settlers emerged in Palestine, up to 1947, the total land acquisition by the Zionist settlers and the Jewish National Fund, which become the avenue by which their property or land are acquired, the total land is 6% of historical Palestine. Some of the land was sold by Palestinians, there's no question about it, meaning that uh, elites and rich individuals uh, often don't have a nationality, and just you need to look at our bankers and what they did to understand what we are saying. Uh, some were sold by Lebanese uh, rich affluent families, uh, some were sold by other interests, some were sold by churches in Palestine. So the record is available for anyone to look at the transfer of properties between 1876 to 1947, and we have an accounting of every property that's sold and transferred that accounts for 6%. Therefore, you have to understand that the Palestinians were given or uh, asked to let go of the majority of their land to a population that was imposed on them by the British during a period of 20 years. And not only that, it actually, they were not party to the discussions or the negotiations that were taking place in New York. Meaning the discussions during the United Nations, did not, the Palestinian delegation was not even allowed to participate in the liberation. Further to say that it was the United States pressure on some of the participants in the debate to threaten them of the withdrawal of foreign, U.S. foreign aid if they don't vote for Resolution 181. Meaning that once again, it's not high moral purpose that brought about the creation of the State of Israel. It's low political pressure and manipulation of political discourse at the highest level that brought about the creation and the adoption of Resolution 181. The Palestinians did not accept Resolution 181. And I know some smart aleck who's going to stand up and say, you rejected 181, and therefore, tough luck, history moved on. And I say, you're accurate, correct, history moves on, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. After Resolution 181, Zionism did not only want to have 54% of the land, it had actually wanted more. And we have already understood that within the inner circle of Ben-Gurion and some of the Zionist leadership in Palestine, the Jewish state that they were accorded by the United Nations was not a sufficient state in terms of its demographics. In 1948, and here we're speaking about the land that was given to be the Jewish state. 50% of the population was Jewish and 50% of the population was Arab. Meaning Israel had a demographic problem in the state that was accorded to it. It seems Israel always have a demographic problem because that's the same debate today. Ben-Gurion and the Zionist movement actually favored the transfer and as early as 1936-37 with the white paper mentioning that in case that there is a two-state solution we need to transfer up to 200,000 Arabs uh, from uh, the land that is to be designated as a Jewish state. Therefore, we need to understand why the Nakba occurred. And this is something that is very important, and it runs deep at the foundation of the Palestine-Israel conflict. Israel says the following, that the Palestinians who were 
who left Palestine in 1948, 750,000 of them, left because Arab leaders got on their radio broadcast and called on them to leave because the Arab armies are going to come and throw the Jews to the sea. That's the basic language that is used. You find it in almost every rendition in the pro-Israel literature. The challenge is still out there for anyone to present a record of any Arab broadcast that said to the Palestinians to leave their homes and land. And you need to produce the station, the date, the time, and the speaker. So far, Israel has not produced any of that record. Now, not only that, but this record is available to us. You actually go to the British Museum and to the US Smithsonian's Museum because they monitor all the broadcasts coming out from the Arab world. Meaning spy was already, spying was a career at that early stage. What we found actually is the opposite. Arab leaders ordering the Palestinians to stay put, not to leave, because they did not want to deal with the mass influx of refugees coming to their territories at a time where they're unable to accommodate. Now in here I understand what the pro-Israel Arguments in it because they want to remove the moral responsibility for the eviction of the Palestinians. And not only that, to blame the victim for the fact that they are being they were victimized. That is at the core of the Palestinian Israel issue. Meaning that Israel so far does not accept the responsibility that it had taken systematic process to expel the Palestinians from their homes, from their lands, from their properties. This included 750,000 Palestinians. This included 531 villages that were completely razed to the ground. This includes seven urban centers with some of their population being driven out with guns actually being shot over their head with the statement, go see Abdullah, or go and see your Arab brethren, in this case. Now, why do we mention this? Israel claims itself to be a representation of the civilized world. Then we need to judge it according to the principles it puts out. You can't say that the Palestinians are responsible for their own eviction, where you systematically evicted them, with a plan already predetermined and pre-discussed before the actual war takes place. Plan Delete, we know that there was a discussion about it, there were already plans about it, before the war commenced. Second, Palestinians' properties, land, resources were taken over by a state, meaning we distinguish between non-state actors and state actors. Non-state actors versus state actors. We could say that the Deir Yassin massacre and some of the massacres before May 15, 1948, we could say non-state actors conducted this, even though that they were acting in a state to be. But after May 15, 1948, the action of Israel as a state actor should be held to the standard of state actors. And therefore, post-1948, Israel engaged in the systematic confiscation, systematic dispossession, systematic thievery at the highest level, knowingly doing so, and systematically doing so. That is a state responsibility and the state have to live up to those standards. Why do we say this? There's another notion that is also runs deep to hurt the Palestinians and their understanding and their views. There is this notion that Palestine was a desert. How many of you heard this? That we made the desert blue. That makes that the Palestinian society did not have anything in there until 1948 where Israel is created and then the desert is made to bloom. Now, 